Welcome to this podcast on an integrated scenario. This will involve a discussion about a particular scenario which will be discussed in the podcast and all the questions will be related to the hardware, software, internet and networking, data and information and solution development related and applied to this integrated scenario. These topics are from question 9 of the 2023 Computer Applications Technology November Paper 2 exam or theory exam. There are three ways that you can engage with the content of this podcast. If you want to test your knowledge, then download the questions covered in the video first. The link to the PDF is in the video description. Then go and attempt those questions. And finally, come back and listen to the podcast so that you can compare the discussion with your answers. If you want to use the podcast to learn your information, then first listen to the discussion, then download the questions, the PDF link in the video description mentioned earlier, and then test yourself to see how much you remember from the discussion. Or you can simply enjoy the discussion and learn more about how the different forms of computing can be applied to this integrated scenario. And now let's hear what our podcasters have to say about this particular scenario. Ever been deep in a game and thought, Ah, wow, there's a lot going on in the hood here. Or maybe you're learning about computers and wondering how all that stuff actually, you know, fits together. Well, today you're in the right place. We're doing a deep dive into a pretty cool scenario that mixes both. Setting up, like, the ultimate gaming experience. That's right. Picture this. A community hall decides, hey, let's open a gaming room. Not just video games, but maybe even techie board games, too. And suddenly, bam, you've got all these tech questions to figure out. Exactly. And we've got this info here, um, looking at everything, the PCs themselves, getting them networked, keeping them safe. Even planning a tournament and getting the word out is a really neat sort of real-world computing puzzle. And for you listening, especially if you're doing computer studies, this isn't just, like, fun speculation. No, it's practical. Yeah, it Pre shows you how hardware, software, networking, security, all those things you learn about actually combine to build something real and, you know, fun. Think of it as seeing your coursework, like, in action. Precisely. So we're basically working through a set of questions and answers about this whole gaming room project. Like, we're on the planning team. Okay, so first things first. The machines. The muscle. They're considering some pretty beefy PCs. Uh-huh. What have we got? Okay, check this. AMD Ryzen 7... 5700X CPU. Nice. Eight cores, good for gaming. An RTX 3070 graphics card. Very solid GPU, great for visuals. MSI by 570 motherboard, 32 gigs of DDR4 RAM. 32 gigs, wow. And fast RAM too. And a one terabyte NVMe SSD. Whoosh, super quick loading. All in an ATX case, run the Windows 11, NOD32 antivirus, Office 365. Standard stuff for management and security there. Plus the usual peripherals, keyboard, mouse, headset, and even a steering wheel and joystick. Okay, so definitely geared towards gaming. Right. So question 9.1.1 asks, what kind of user is this setup really for? Well, the source flat out says power super user, Fixed gamer. Kill. And yeah, looking at those specs, it makes total sense. Why specifically? What makes it scream gamer? Okay, so that Ryzen 7 CPU loads of processing power for demanding games. It won't bottleneck easily. Right, keeps things smooth even when there's a lot happening on screen. Exactly. And the RTX 3070 graphics card, that's the key part for making games look amazing, right? Yeah. High flame rates, all the visual details. Yeah. It really hits that sweet spot for, say, 1440p gaming, great visuals without needing, like, the absolute top-end, super expensive card. Makes sense. Yes. You need that GPU power. And the 32 gigs of RAM and that NVMe SSD, that's all about speed, right? Less waiting. Totally. Less waiting for games to load, faster response times in general. The system just feels snappy. Banishing the loading screens. Always good. Gamers appreciate that, definitely. More playing, less waiting around. Okay, simpler question now, 9.1.2. How do you measure a monitor size? Ah, that's straightforward. It's always measured diagonally. Diagonally. Yep, from one corner of the screen to the opposite corner. That's the standard way, whether it's a monitor or a TV. Got it. Good basic fact to know. Okay, moving to software, mm -hmm. question 9.1.3, ask for two types of utility software. Right, and the examples given were things like antivirus, disk cleanup, defragmenter, backup tools, file compression, task scheduler, file management, lots of options. So for anyone maybe newer to this, what exactly is utility software? What's its job? Um, basically, utility software helps manage and maintain the computer. It's like the toolkit for the operating system. The behind-the-scenes crew. Kind of, yeah. Keeping things optimized, secure, 
running smoothly. They're the unsung heroes, you could say. Okay, so let's pick two from that list. Antivirus, like the NOD32 they mentioned. What's that doing? Antivirus is essential. It's like the system's bodyguard, constantly watching for malicious stuff, viruses, malware, uh, ransom. And I see things you don't want. Exactly. It finds them, locks them, gets rid of them, keeps your data safe and your computer working properly. Crucial. Okay. And how about uh, disk cleanup? Disk cleanup is like the janitor. It finds and removes temporary files, old installers, stuff in the recycle bin. Yeah. Basically, digital junk you don't need anymore. And why do that? Frees up valuable disk space, makes your computer potentially run a bit faster, gives it more breathing room. It's good digital hygiene. Like spring cleaning for your hard drive. Makes yeah, sense. Pretty much. All right, next question. 9.1.4. Suggest two additional hardware devices they might want for these gaming PCs. Okay, the options listed were Blu-ray or DVD drives, VR glasses, a printer, scanner, an extra or bigger screen, speakers, webcam, microphone, Lots of possibilities. For a gaming room, what jumps out? Well, considering they already have steering wheels and joysticks, VR glasses seem like a natural fit, don't they? Oh, yeah. Imagine flight sims or racing games in VR. Exactly. Super immersive. It could be a real draw. Though, you know, there are practical things to consider, like hygiene and set up in a shared space. True. What about another one? Maybe something more uh, basic. Speakers, maybe. Well, headsets are good for focus. Right, everyone gets their own sound. Good speakers allow for a more social vibe, maybe for less intense games or if people are watching. Plus, you need them for general audio, maybe announcements. Good point. Not everyone wants headphones all the time. Okay, let's talk networking. They need to connect these 10 PCs. Yep, a small network. Question 9.2.1. What kind of cabled media would they likely use and why? The answer points to UTP or STP cables. That's twisted pair specifically CCAT5 or CAT6 Ethernet cables. Twisted pair. That's the standard network cable you see plugged into routers, right? That's the one. UTP means unshielded twisted pair. STP is shielded. The twisting helps reduce interference. And why choose that? Why twisted pair Ethernet? Main reasons given are cost and ease of setup. It's generally cheaper and simpler to install than something like fiber optics, especially for a small network like this. And what about CAT5 versus CAT6? CAT6 can handle faster speeds and more data, so it's a bit more future-proof. But CAT5 might be okay for 10 PCs, depending on what they're doing. CAT6 is probably the better bet nowadays, though. Gotcha. Reliable, fast enough for gaming, and doesn't break the bank. That's the idea. Wired connections are generally more stable than Wi-Fi for gaming, too. Less lag. Okay, next networking question, 9.2.2. Give one reason why they might not need a dedicated server for this setup. Ah, interesting. The source suggests a few possibilities. Maybe each PC is managed individually, or a server just isn't needed for gaming. What else? Maybe they don't need central file storage, or because games are often hosted peer-to-peer -peer or on external internet servers anyway. So it could be what's called a peer-to-peer -peer network. Exactly. In a peer-to-peer -peer setup, the computers talk directly to each other. There's no single central machine controlling everything. Like equals talking to equals. Pretty much. For a small setup focused purely on gaming, where the main connections are either direct player-to-player -player or out to the internet, you might skip the complexity and cost of a dedicated server. Keeps things simpler. Potentially, yes, yeah. though managing updates and things might need a different approach. Right. Okay, shifting gears slightly. Printers. For admin tasks, question 9.2.3 asks for two factors to consider when buying one. And the list of potential factors is long. Printer type, color, speed, resolution, paper handling, connectivity, costs, future needs, energy use, even printing from USB sticks. Okay, so out of all that, what are two really key things for an admin printer? Well, I'd say print speed is usually pretty important in any kind of office or admin setting. Why speed? Just efficiency, really. If you need to print batches of forms or info sheets, you don't want to be waiting ages for the printer to finish. Time saved is good. Okay, makes sense. And a second factor. Cost per page, definitely. The initial price of the printer is one thing, but the ongoing cost of ink or toner, that can really add up. Uh, the consumables. Exactly. Choosing a printer that's economical to run with a low cost for each page it prints can save a lot of money in the long run. Smart budgeting. Okay, now security. These are valuable PCs in a public-ish space. Question 9.3.1. Name two physical safeguards. Right, physical protection. The answers include things like burglar bars, security guards, steel doors, mesh in the roof. Serious stuff. Locks, alarms, cameras, basically ways to physically stop or deter theft or damage. So if they chose, say, locks and cameras, how would those help? 
Well, locks are obvious, locking the room itself. Maybe using cable locks to secure the PCs and monitors to the desks so they can't just be picked up and carried away easily. Right, it makes them harder to steal quickly. And cameras act as a deterrent. People are less likely to try something if they know they're being recorded. Plus, if something does happen, you have evidence. Layered security. Makes sense. The next, 9.3.2. What tech could they use for easy tracking or monitoring of the equipment? The options mentioned are RFID tags, barcode or QR code stickers, or even Bluetooth tracking devices. Ways to electronically ID the gear. Okay, let's take barcodes or QR codes. How would that work day to day? Pretty simple, really. You stick a unique code label on every single item, PC, monitor, keyboard, maybe even the chairs. Everything gets a label. Yep. Then you can use a scanner or even just a phone app to quickly scan the codes for inventory checks, lugging items in or out. It's a low-cost way to keep track of all your assets. Like a library system for computer parts. Kind of, yeah. Cool. The secure storage area is protected by a lock, which opens by scanning a fingerprint. Briefly explain what this type of security is called and give one disadvantage. Ah, okay. Simple question, but probably leads to some interesting places, especially yeah. for anyone studying computing after. Precisely. It gets you thinking about the practical side of security tech. So let's tackle the first part. When you're using something unique about your body, like a fingerprint, to unlock something, hmm. what do we call that? That's called biometric security. Biometric, okay. Yeah, bio for biological and metric for measurement. So you're using unique biological traits, in this case, your fingerprint for identification to prove it's really you. Right, using something that's, well, part of you. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. But uh, the second part of the question, the disadvantage, that seems key. It is, and the source material we looked at actually gives us a few different angles on the downsides. It highlights mm. that it's not always, you know, completely straightforward. So what's one potential problem? Well, the first one mentioned is super practical. Dirty fingerprint will not scan. Uh, yeah, I can see that. Right. Like after gardening or eating something greasy. Exactly. Just everyday life stuff. Mm. Grime, oil, dirt. It yeah. can obscure the fingerprint ridges enough that the scanner just can't get a good read. It's a very real world issue. Totally. It's not some like sophisticated attack vector. It's just dirt. Pretty much. And uh, building on that, the source also notes, if the surface of the biometric device is dirty, it will not span the finger correctly. Uh, oh, right. So even if your finger is clean, if the scanner itself is smudged. Yep. Same problem. It needs a clear view, so both the finger and the scanner need to be relatively clean for it to work reliably. Huh. So cleanliness is a surprisingly big factor then. It really is. Then there's another point. Changes in fingerprint structure will not allow access. Changes? Like what? Could be minor things, honestly. A small cut, maybe a blister, a burn. No. Or even, you know, some skin conditions can temporarily alter the ridge patterns if the pattern changes too much from what's stored. You're locked out. Okay. Imagine getting locked out because of a paper cut. It highlights how physical this digital security still is, doesn't it? It really does. Okay, what else? Another fundamental aspect pointed out is that fingerprint access cannot be shared. Person must be present. Ah, okay. Unlike a password or like a, a key card you could lend someone. Exactly. You can't easily delegate access. Your fingerprint is, well, yours. Mm. You physically have to be there to scan it. That's a really crucial point for system design, I guess. Great for personal security on, say, your phone. But maybe not ideal if a team needs access to something or you need someone to cover for you. Precisely. It creates limitations if shared or delegated access is a requirement. Now let's jump into the fun stuff again. Virtual reality. Question 9.5.1 asks for a brief explanation of VR. Okay, the source definition is... Technology creates a 3D environment simulation for seemingly real interaction. So basically, it tricks your brain into thinking you're somewhere else. Pretty much. Uh -huh. It uses a headset to block out the real world and show you a computer-generated one, making you feel immersed like you're actually in that digital space. Very cool tech. But question 9.5.2 asks for two disadvantages or limitations. Right. And the suggestions are things like physical side effects, motion sickness, maybe bumping into things, uh -huh. psychological concerns, although that's maybe less common, and the availability or cost of the equipment itself. Motion sickness seems common with VR. What causes that exactly? It's often a disconnect between what your eyes see and what your body feels. Your eyes see movement in the virtual world, but your inner ear says you're sitting still. That sensory mismatch can make you feel quite nauseous. Not ideal for a fun gaming session. Definitely not. And the other point, the cost and availability. 
Yeah, how's that limitation? Well, VR headsets and the potentially powerful PCs needed to run them aren't cheap. It's a significant investment, especially if you want multiple setups. So it limits how many people can use it at once and adds to the overall budget. Exactly. Plus, managing and maintaining that specialized gear takes effort. Okay, good points. Now, the grand finale. They're hosting a gaming tournament. First up, comfy seating. Question 9.6.1. Give one feature of a good gaming chair. Ah, ergonomics. The answers focus on that. Adjustable armrests, height adjustment, movable base, breathable materials, things like that. Why are ergonomics so important for gamers? If you're sitting for hours during a tournament, you need proper support. Adjustable armrests, for example, help support your arms and reduce strain on your wrists and shoulders. Keeps you comfortable, prevents aches and pains. Yeah, better comfort, better focus, maybe even better performance. Mm -hmm. And less chance of injury long term. Makes sense. Now, advertising the tournament, question 9.6.2. Give two ways ICT can help. ICT information and communication tech. The examples are social media, websites, email, maybe even radio or TV ads. Social media seems like a no-brainer these days, right? Absolutely. You can reach a huge audience, create event pages, post updates, share clips, use hashtags, maybe even run targeted ads to reach local gamers. Very effective. Targeted ads, smart. What about a website? Why bother with that? A website or even just a dedicated page on the community hall site acts as the official info hub. The central source of truth. Exactly. You can put detailed rules, schedules, prize info, registration forms, FAQs, everything in one place. Looks more professional, too. Good point. Okay, people are signing up. Question 9.6.3. What Microsoft Office app is best for managing tournament entries? The answer given is Microsoft Access. Access, not Word or Excel. Why Access? Because Access is a database. It's specifically designed to handle structured information like lists of names, contact details, game choices, etc. So it's better at organizing that kind of data. Much better. You can easily sort, search, filter, and generate reports from the data in Access. It's way more powerful and less prone to errors for managing lists like this compared to a spreadsheet or just a document. Ah, uh, okay. Built for the job. Mm -hmm. Finally, after the fun is over, they want to send personalized thank you letters. Question 9.6.4, what word processing feature makes this easy? That would be mail merge. Mail merge. <laughs> Sounds useful. How does it actually work? It's brilliant, actually. You write one main template letter in, say, Microsoft Word, and then you connect it to your list of participants, maybe the list you managed in Access or even Excel. Okay. Then mail merge automatically pulls the name and maybe other details for each person from the list and inserts it into a copy of the template letter. So it creates like dozens of slightly different letters automatically. Exactly. Personalized letters for everyone on your list wow. without you having to type each one out individually. Huge time saver as a nice personal touch. That's really clever. So, wow, looking back, Setting up this gaming room and running a tournament really touches on so many different areas of computing, doesn't it? It really does. Hardware specs, networking, security measures, software choices, even database management and document features like mail merge. It's way more than just plugging things in. Absolutely. It's a perfect example of how all those concepts you might learn separately in computer studies actually interconnect and get applied to solve real problems and create something, you know, engaging and fun. It really shows the practical side of it all. Not just theory, but building things. Definitely. It connects the classroom learning to tangible outcomes. So considering all the tech packed into just this one community gaming room, mm. it makes you wonder, doesn't it, what other maybe unexpected ways is computing shaping our free time, our community spaces? Hmm, yeah. And what comes next? What future tech might change these experiences even more? Definitely something to think about. All this content and a whole lot more are covered in our YouTube channel, at Mr. Long Computer Terms. So it would really help the channel if you can become a subscriber and share us with your friends. That's the only thing I'm going to be ever asking of you. And remember, don't do it the long way. Do it the Mr. Long way.